Hi, everyone, to another Wednesday. What is this? Warriors Whiteboard Wednesday. Dashian Miller here from Warrior Concepts. And so uh, this week, we're going to take a look at mastering the katana. No, I'm not covering everything that you need to master the katana. What we're going to do is we're going to take a look at uh, several aspects of the training. Uh, this, is a, this is a format that I normally use regardless of what skill, spear, sword, staff, uh, unarmed, whatever, right? Okay. So we're going to be breaking things down into three areas, basics, dynamics, and staging. I'll explain those as we go along. And then in each one, there is, uh, in each one, there's three variables or three training areas that we'll take a look at, right? Got this cool little thing, download your work, free worksheet. Don't forget to do that, okay? Got this worksheet uh, uh, on the website that um, later on we'll talk about uh, how you can get that and download it, add some extra notes, go back through the video, that kind of stuff, okay? So... I do have plans uh, later on to use this uh, lesson as uh, part of a, uh, a an actual paid enrollment kind of uh, program. So you guys are getting that up front for nothing. Okay. So anyway, let's just jump right in because my t schedule is tight today. All right. So let me get rid of my handy dandy little marker here. All right. So let's start by talking about what it's not. All right. And uh, I used to, you never know that I used to be an artist, right? Uh, but anyway, okay, so uh, just really, really quickly, okay, between looking at the weapons pages in a martial arts magazine uh, or in a martial arts supply catalog or whatever, right, they hire these folks, some are martial artists, some are not, whatever, right, and they're trying to sell these things or they're trying to take pictures for an article, right, and they go, here, hold this, okay, and then you get these pictures, okay, and Unfortunately, what ends up happening is for folks who are trying to, I don't know, train for free, uh, they don't think that they need an instructor. I had somebody post uh, something on one of my uh, one of my videos where I was talking about instructors and and uh, little litmus test for making sure somebody's a good instructor, bad instructor, whatever. Right. Uh, he goes, you know what? They're just a bunch of overpaid uh, whatever. Fill in the blank. Um, I've never found a need for them okay, um, because I already know how to do this stuff. And my response to that is, it's a good thing that multi-million dollar paid professional athletes don't believe the same thing, okay, when it comes to their coaches. Because it's my bet that at least all the first stringers, if not most of the people on the team, they get paid quarter, half, million, multiple millions of dollars on their contract, can outrun, outpass, out throw, outmaneuver, outperform 80, 90% of the coaching staff. And yet they still learn from these folks. Why? Well, because they've either done it before or because they understand the tactical and strategic aspects of the games or the game or the sport, whatever they're playing, even if they themselves can't play or can't play anymore. Right. So anyway, right. Um, that goes also for the for the folks that go, I can't take you seriously. I can't learn from anybody who uh, is as old as you, weighs what you weigh or has that shape or, well, okay. Right? So, uh, and yet, again, multimillionaire uh, professional sports athletes um, have a little bit more humility because they're going to learn how to play better, perform better, and win more easily from people that, I don't know, might have – a few extra brain cells. Anyway, all right, so let's start by taking a look at what the katana, the samurai sword, we're talking about the long sword, even though there are shorter versions and all that, anybody that goes through the warrior concepts uh, or the Bujikan Mori no Tora uh, dojo curriculum, stick it out long enough, they end up learning four different swords, not counting the knife, okay? So, but everybody starts with the katana when it comes to classical blades, because it's the long sword, it's the long weapon, it's the one that everything else is based on, okay? I know that there are longer dachi, that's one of them. Uh, people just see it as an oversized katana, but it's not. The metallurgy was different, which means it doesn't hold the same kind of an edge. It's used differently the way it's maneuvered. So again, just because it looks like doesn't make it so, okay? So anyway, so what is it not, okay? The first thing it's not is it's not a damn baseball bat. Okay, or a cricket bat or whatever, 
that you might have uh, in, in your country, okay? Um, you know, I pulled one of my better swords and uh, let's see. <sighs> Sorry about that. Set it too far away from everything, right? So uh, this is just, this, this is my beater sword. It was, I don't know, three, 400 bucks, whatever. Okay, so anyway, um, what I mean by that is it's not held like a baseball bat, okay? Hands aren't together, whatever, okay? Uh, next thing it isn't, okay? It's not a European or a, it's not a Scottish Claymore, or generally speaking, a European broadsword. Okay. While those swords also are two-handed, right? The katana, metallurgically speaking, right? Based on the way the metal's designed and all that kind of stuff, um, holds a finer edge. It's more razor blade-like, not that these things can't cut, right? Uh, but holds a finer edge, but that also makes it more brittle, right? The katana is designed to be a quick moving surgical implement, right? These, the claymore, the broadswords, those kind of things, right? Um, part of their martial system includes just bashing somebody with this thing, right? These big old smashing kind of strikes. So, and again, I'm not knocking them. They do have an edge, right? They, they have a sharpness to them, but they're more like big old, cleavers or chisels with a handle. Okay. And again, right. They open people up and, and, and whatnot. Right. Okay. But they're not the same, which means again, you're not holding it in a way where you're going to bash and smash because that would damage the katana's blade. Okay. And the last thing that they're not, right. I'm going to write this thing up here, right. They're not a pirate sword. Okay. Now, I don't know how many people have actually like taken a look at what kind of blades or whatever pirates carry outside of, I don't know, Pirates of the Caribbean movie and whatever they've seen, right? Uh, but typically, pirates would use whatever they could get a hold of because, well, they're not being supplied by any kind of army or whatever, right? They typically show up with whatever they have. But um, what I'm talking about is that they don't have like a cutlass, which is often associated with the, um, uh, the pirates because of the navies, right? They would have been ex-navy guys and whatnot and probably had these uh, cutlass kind of swords, right? Uh, it's not a saber, okay? And it's not uh, a scimitar, which is more of a Asian, uh, East Asian kind of thing, right? What I mean is it doesn't have this big old scooping kind of thing, which was like less thrusting, more dragging cuts, OK. Um, and while there are Japanese systems that use pull cuts with a, with a katana, the way they were sharpened, they were sharpened uh, and the way they're used, there's more of a push cutting kind of thing going on, because if you drag against the body, it locks in against bone or whatever. You want to be moving that person away from you, which also means you're moving whatever weapon they have away from you. OK. Again, I'm not covering use today. What we're going to take a look at are nine areas of study moving through three levels of proficiency that will hopefully get us there, right? Um, but as I was just talking to folks uh, about, let's see, I think on Monday's Kuden on the podcast uh, and to my inner circle guys, there's always a point for nearly everyone, right? There, there's a very it's a very narrow, very tiny group of people who will just continue to train because it's about skill proficiency. And uh, I, I, this is so important that I made sure that I even included it on the worksheet if you download it, right? Um, the, the whole idea is that if you're focusing on mastery, there is always skill progression. There is always a next step, okay? Not just techniques, but regardless of whether somebody even like does more than a class or two, or, you know, they go from fantasy, interest, desire, whatever, to actually starting to do some work for almost everyone, 99.8% of the people that get involved in any kind of training, any kind of activity, any kind of sport, right? They will hit a stop gap 
And that stop gap is the point just before, right? The next step, that next place is, and they either think this, feel this, or say this. That's just too, too much damn work. Okay? So that's when they stop. They stop practicing or they stop learning and progressing and they only work on what it is that they've been working on, right? Or that they've gotten good at, right? Um, or the fantasy dream, uh, goal, interest, whatever, right? Turns into the need for work. And so they make a conscious or unconscious decision, even if their mouth keeps talking about other things, I'm talking about the actions that they have in the world, right? That's too much damn work. Okay. So it's going to be easier to get the guy on the TV screen or the monitor to do the work for me, uh, or for me to talk about what I've done or whatever, okay. Um, than to actually do the work because I don't want to put in that kind of work, right? If I could go through a drive through window system, and get my master's degree or diploma. If you don't believe that exists, scroll, go to the back of Black Belt Magazine or some of these online places and whatnot and find all the organizations that have popped up that are more than willing to take people's money in exchange for a certificate that says that they are Grand Poobah of Tic Tac No or whatever. Okay. Anyway, right. So the katana is not these things. I'm not here to tell you all the stuff that it is because um, you can Google a lot of that stuff, right? But there was a development, a developmental period, right, where uh, Japanese swords swords started off with this straight design. Uh, it's called a chokto, right, which roughly means Chinese uh, blade, right. So the straight kind of thing. But there was this developmental period where what they were trying to do, and again, this is uber summarized, right. What they were trying to do was take the weight and heft and damage potential from the Chinese broadsword, right and mix it, combine it with the, with the swiftness and agility, right, of what you see in like wushu type blades and things like that, right? So I can move this thing very quickly, but it doesn't have the same kind of penetration. The broadsword, great penetration, lopping off limbs and things like that, not very fast. So over time, they brought these things together, and that's how you ended up with a certain type of curvature and all that kind of stuff, right? We're not here to talk about that. What we're going to do is take a look at, again, these nine elements, okay? So we're looking at student skill proficiency development and progression, okay? So again, this is all based off of this worksheet, right? I'll give you the email, the uh, URL here in a bit if you want it. If you don't, no big deal. You can take a screenshot or scribble notes very, very quickly or whatever, okay? So I always break all of our skill progression stuff down into three areas. Basics, what I call dynamics, and what I call staging. You could also call it intent, whatever, okay? And there's different things in different places, okay? Basics tend to focus on mechanics. How do I do the thing that needs to be done? You could be doing kata, but it's not about the kata, right? There are these key elemental pieces, okay? And again, I always borrow the, the three-in-one, one-in-three principle from the Gyoko school. So... Uh, that's where these things are, right? So basics, what we're looking at um, are the foundational pieces, the building blocks, okay? So in no particular order, but they're all in here anyway, right? Okay? So one is your kamai, your postures, okay? Not Again, not to be confused with stances. I, I, I covered this again last night in a uh, inner circle coaching call with my private students, Um that there's always this, this mix up that we have to make sure that we understand, but come on postures, right? So what are we learning here? Right. We're learning how to hold our body in just, I, I, I'm going to pick one element because of time. Right. So what we're looking at right here is uh, tactical positioning. Now there's a lot more to this, right. How to hold the body uh, proper alignment so you maintain balance, but also have freedom of movement. Uh, things in here, tactical positioning includes things like uh, making sure the weapon stays between you and the bad guy. Yes, there are there are uh, exceptions to the rule, just like there are for most things, right, where the weapon's not there, but there's always a tactical reason or a strategic reason for doing that, okay? where It's not just haphazardly, right? 
often what people want to do uh, if they confuse come I with stances is they see this as a necessary evil that they have to learn so they can move on to the cool stuff. I'm here to tell you that if you learn these things and you learn them properly, it's damn near impossible for him to get at you without running into things. Okay. Come I is what allows you to set things up in the beginning so that it is as difficult as possible for him to get at you while as easy as possible for you to do your thing. I didn't say easy. I said as easy as possible because you're in a life or death situation. Okay. So uh, that kind of stuff, right? Um, and again, hopefully by the time you got the sword, you've also done a bunch of this Taijutsu work where all those lessons about freedom of movement and positioning and all that kind of stuff uh, are going to matter. Okay. But come on, posturing, right? Okay. Another one is EI. Okay. EI, EI. No, I'm just kidding. Right. Anyway, EI. Okay. EI, most people see that as quick draw and cut, right? Quick draw a sword kind of thing, right? Um, all of our stuff is really, really old. So EI, EI is solo drawing and cutting to us where you are cutting targets and, and those kind of things. But what I mean here is the ability to draw the sword efficiently and effectively and resheath it without giving up the benefits of Kamai, which means you're always in a guarded position as you're drawing it, as you're uh, putting it away. Uh, this includes how to wear it on the belt, how to draw it, how to catch it with your hand, all those kind of things, right? There's a whole bunch of things to this, okay? So this is um, this is bearing, bearing and resheathing the sword without losing the benefits of Kamai, tactical positioning, okay? At any point while I'm putting that sword away, the sword should be in a guard position, and at any point, I should be able to redraw and engage if another threat comes in, which means I shouldn't be doing this. Okay? I need to be able to draw it quickly, right? Here, we understand, and again, this is going to translate directly to something that's going on down here. All of these things always do, right? By combining these, we end up producing these, or we end up recognizing that there's uh, kind of what if areas that, that need to be covered. Okay. So here I need to make sure that I can actively engage. I can get that weapon out. One of the key pieces with drawing a sword that's going to end up uh, being really, really important when it comes to uh, when it comes to live engagement. And it's the same, whether we have a handgun, whether we have uh, a knife in a, in a sheath or a holster right on the belt or strapped to the leg or whatever is one of the key points in the scrolls is that the blade should not attack the scabbard and the scabbard shouldn't attack the blade. How does that mean? I mean, it's not attacking anything there. They're, it's like a glove. One's inside the other one. Ah. But if the angle changes too soon or we don't draw it properly, right? The blade comes into contact with the inner walls of the scabbard and all wooden scabbards are made to the specific sword that they carry. Okay, remember they were all unique; they weren't stamped out uh, in a factory like the forty nine ninety five special we can get from Asian World of Martial Arts. No offense to Asian World of Martial Arts. Okay, uh, but when if if they bite against each other, you run one of two risks: one, the blade jamming or slowing down on the way out. So you need to put more work in there. It takes longer to get it out and then you die. Okay. Or you lever it and the Kisaki or the Boshi, right? The working edges of the blade cut through that thin wood and take your hand off and then you die. Okay. So remember the consequences, it's kind of like uh, in the Christian Bible, right? The wages of sin are death. Okay. Sin is historically an old archer's term and it means to miss your mark okay so from a warrior standpoint sinning or screwing up or doing something where it causes more time or misunderstanding something and it you're not being able to have the kind of speed you need or whatever right the consequences of failed warrior technique mistiming, wrong distance, wrong angling, whatever, is death. But I don't think a lot of martial artists get that because 
they think in terms of high school fist fights or uh, competitive tournaments and whatnot. So there'll always be an aftermath. There'll always be talking smack and there's always another day. From a warrior's perspective, you screw this up, your family better look good in black. Okay. So come I, EI, and the third one is kitty. Okay. Not the cat. Okay. It's not kitty. Kitty. Okay. Kitty. Kitty is cutting. Okay. So what's cutting about, right? Cutting is about actively engaging with a target so that you're not just effective, but you're efficient. Okay. And again, we're not going into uh, the, the makeup of the Japanese sword and all that, but the way the sides of a Japanese sword are made, right? The, the, the cut of it, right? From spine to kisaki to the edge is not the same as these other ones, okay? The bevel is different, okay? That's important, okay? Because when I cut, okay, if there's waiver to the action, right? If it's not a smooth cut, if that... The, the cross section, I'm going to draw one possible cross section, and it's a very simple one, right? From spine to edge, right? Okay. So it, it doesn't bow this way. It doesn't cut in or whatever. Just this one, okay? So this is spine edge. This is the cutting edge, okay? If this is wavering, it's doing one of these numbers as it, as it makes contact with the target, right? It's going to slam in. If we don't have a push cut going on, it doesn't glide, right? These things are not sharpened to be like meat cleavers. Okay, another difference between claymores and broadswords and all that. Right? No hacking cuts. Can you? Sure. The problem is, like, if I come in with this on this line straight, like most people think of, right? You come in with the edge right on it, so it's going in like a chisel. The problem with that is that this wedge is in like a chisel. The human body is not a is not a log. Okay. So it's not going to pop apart this way, okay? What makes that cool thing happen when you watch um, Tatamio Molte uh, cutting uh, targets, uh, getting cut and that top piece pops off, okay? It's because, well, let me use a different color. And it happens because the swordsman is skilled at lining up a flat edge as the cutting line. Now see what happens? The thing that's being cut peels away this way, and you only have resistance barely on one side. But if you come in like a cleaver, it's going to get stuck. And if it gets stuck, you can't get it out in time before the next one comes, you die. Okay? I'm going to say that a lot today. Okay? But again, if we're not – back in the day, right, if you screwed this up, shit like that was happening all the time. Okay? I think – it's the same reason that I think that, that – Knife fighting in martial arts and self-defense classes tends to be more real than gun defense. And I don't mean like shooting and stuff like that. I mean unarmed defense against knives or versus unarmed defense against guns. The the knife stuff tends to lean in the direction of it's it's fairly decent stuff. People are more cautious, right? But they'll do some dumbass stuff with gun defense. Okay. And I think it's because there's an instinctive uh there's an instinctive driver behind the knife stuff. It's the rare individual that gets to be our age or you know, I'm way past 20, right? But get to be 18, 20, whatever, that's never been cut, even by accident, right? Most of us cut by accident, right? If, if you were in knife fights, then you know a whole bunch of other things, right? Okay. So they tend to be more respectful of the weapon. Gun stuff practically no one that comes to martial arts or self-defense, right? And when I say practically, I mean out of millions and billions, okay, you got that handful that have, but most people haven't been shot before. Most people haven't even been in the proximity outside of a movie theater where they've heard a gun go off, okay, let alone anything else, right? And it's the bang, that sound, that causes people to, to shut down. Watch movies, even with the, the cool gunslinger or the cop or whatever, right? Watch the Lethal Weapon movies with Mel Gibson, right, shooting, and he's able to do all those shots and all that, okay? But look at the camera cuts to his eyes when he's pulling the trigger, okay? He flinches. He blinks every time because he's preemptively reacting to the bang. You can't hit targets the way they were showing in that movie, right? 
with that kind of flinch re, uh, re response or reflex. Okay, doesn't work that way, right? But th this is this is just one of those pieces, right? So with Kitty, right? Okay, how how do I get the edge from this start position in the come eye, right? And how do I cut in a way that closes off all my targets and the weapon or the, the cutting action plays off the shielding aspect of Kamai? Because in Japanese martial arts, the weapon is also the shield, right? So we're not, okay, with these big things, huge, heavy things, right? You need a lot of muscle and heft to get these things in motion, okay? So it's not that you can drop it on somebody and ding them, but if they were in armor, you die, okay? So how? Effectively, efficiently, quickly, that kind of thing, right? Okay, so this is your basics, right? This is the stuff that gets trained a lot, okay? Up front, it's also the boring stuff. It's the redundant stuff, right? Continue to go to come on, moving around the weapon, Okay. I know the weapon is moving, but the weapon's moving because I'm moving my rear, my, I'm moving my legs and I'm moving in a way that follows him. So this stays between he and I, okay? It's not this where my feet aren't moving and the weapon's moving around me. That's what opens up things, okay? I want to think cannon. Cannons get steered from the base so that the muzzle points where you want the round to go. Right, you don't twist the cannon barrel to point it in different directions. Okay, so anyway, so your basics come I EI, right? So we've got posturing, defensive uh, strategic positioning, tactical positioning. We've got how to uh, bring the blade out and put it away quickly, effectively, easily without damaging ourselves, without it getting jammed up. Right, we shouldn't even hear much of a brushing of the side of the blade across the inside of the, uh, the scabbard. Okay. Something I'm personally still working on myself. Okay. You can hear that whoosh when I draw, uh, it's not a scraping, right. But you can hear it, um, at least half the time. Okay. Uh, but how do I get it out? Right. How do I get the blade out in a way, right. Where I go to come on. So it goes from my belt out and now it's in shield position and it's between he and I. Okay. And every school has their thing, but there, there's this thing, right? And then how do I cut once it's out in a way that I don't need to hack this guy a couple of times before he's down? It's one cut. I can keep moving, right? When I cut, I'm all here. I'm also, uh, well, actually, it's going to come down here, right? So we, so we start to put these things together, right? But eventually, we're going to need to take a look at knowing what I'm cutting and where I'm cutting and how I control the plane of my face and all that so that opening up an artery doesn't splash blood into my face and blind me and then I die. Okay. So anyway, right? so let's move down to dynamics. Okay. There's three of these, right? And again, now here we're talking about this stuff you can do solo. Okay. This stuff you can do all by yourself. Okay. So could you do kata? Could you do? Yeah, of course. Right. But just make sure you're not doing kata to stroke ego so you feel warm and fuzzy because I need to fantasize about fighting and winning and stuff like that. Because if you don't get this stuff right, I don't care how many kata you know. Okay. Can I do these under pressure? And that's where this stuff starts coming in. Dynamics, this is based on you, your footwork, your positioning, your movement of the blade, that kind of stuff. Dynamics are based on your movement relative to him. Up here, I don't care for, again, unarmed, spear, sword, staff, what, it doesn't matter. Basics is about you. It's about me, okay? the individual practitioner. Dynamics is about him. Timing, distancing, angling, responsive kind of things, right? Quick uh, keyhole, right? Fundamental pieces in direct response to something or someone coming at me. So what this is, is can you do this under pressure? Can you do this at your time, right? You can do whatever you want, kind of like a gymnast. Here, can you do it at his time, okay? So, uh, and again, no particular order, right? Bato, okay? Bato Jutsu, okay? 
in a lot of martial arts and a lot of Japanese martial arts that where they deal with the sword and they do cutting and stuff like that, right? Drawing and cutting with the sword. Okay. They call it EI. It's kind of a holdover, right? Um, and, but people associate this with draw and cut, whatever. So it's, they assume that's the fighting thing. But EI is about drawing and cutting a target. Okay. If you watch most EI Jitsu masters, they have targets set up that are stationary. They're moving around and they draw and cut, right? And then they cut the, the, the thing again, right? But again, it's like golf, right? It's like going to the range with a rifle or a handgun and shooting a stationary target. It's about precision, right? There's certain validity to that because it allows you to practice, right? But there's no return fire. There's no incoming fire, right? There's no worry about dying before I get him first. Here, bato jutsu, this is an old term, okay? What I want you to think of is bato jutsu is ei jutsu in the fight, okay? He's already coming in with a cut or he's about to draw or whatever, and I need to do that in context, okay? So this is, this is drawing and cutting, right? As long as you make the cut, everybody feels all warm and fuzzy. Here, I need to get that thing out between he and I and preferably making contact with the target, okay? So again, I'm picking one aspect in each of these just for expedience sake, okay? that leaves you plenty of space to go and explore and actually learn yourself something, right? So Bato Jutsu, okay? Uh, one of the key aspects of Bato Jutsu is when I engage the target. Now, I could have, I could already have it out, okay? I could already have the, the, the weapon out or whatever, okay? But we're going to make it the worst possible scenario. His is out, yours is not, so you have to avoid the cut and countercut him at the same time, or it's out and yours is out as well. And so, and this, this is where Keel and Gata come in. That's going to be down here. Okay. But in this one, actually I'll, I'll save that one down here. Bato Jutsu here is doing EI under pressure. Okay. Said more simply, this is cutting, pre this is draw and cut practice. This is don't die practice. It's still draw and cut, but I have to do it while I'm evading proper timing, prop, okay? Timing, distancing, angling, okay? Cutting, getting the blade out and, and doing the cut all at the same time. So it's these three basics while you're, while you're, under, um, while you're under fire, okay? Next one, I'll, I'll move that one up here because I started talking about it anyway, right? So we have Kihon Gata, okay? So either the teacher makes some up so that, and that not made them up based on principles, right? So don't get all like weird and like, you know, scratching your ass or whatever, right? Kiel and got the fundamental moves, parry, redirect, those kind of things, right? Um, in here, you also have things like, um, like these uh, Jodan Uke, right? Kind of things where you're in, in moments where you can't evade, Right. And you're not in a good angle to parry. He has to jump on you. It's getting the sword into block position on this very critical angle that we do with spear. We do with long staff. We do a sword. Uh, we have certain kamai, right? Like Kose, that do the same thing. That when his weapon makes contact with it, right, it deflects it. Okay. And then off that deflection, then we can cut. Okay. So it's things like that. One of the key aspects in, in with the Kion Gata, at least as I was introduced to these things is that you there are three cuts for every one engagement okay there's a story uh that i got through uh hatsumi sensei about takama sensei when he was younger 13 14 whatever and um uh, toda sensei i think was going to be teaching him um spear i think right and so from the Togakure standpoint, I know we're talking about sword, but Togakure sword is based on spear, not on conventional sword. OK, so anyway, uh, he said, you know, you, you know how to block with a sword. 
and cocky teenager at this point, right? He's long since grown out of crybaby nickname from way back when he was being ridden around on a, on the playground, uh, like a, like a horse, right. Crying his eyes out and shit like that. Right. Okay. I know everybody likes to fantasize. Oh, but he's the grandmaster. He would have never read how to me since these books. Okay. So anyway, um, he, uh, he said, okay, so I'm, I'm going to stab her. I'm going to cut and you can block it. Yeah. Well, of course. Yeah. Okay. Well, Takamasa sensei or uh, Toto sensei came in with this, um, with this stab or this cut and Takamasa sensei came up to block. And the next thing you know, he got tagged three times with the, with the spear. Okay. And that was the lesson, right? Every time you engage the attacker or the opponent, he gets tagged or cut or hit or whatever three times. Okay. So one of the first, one of the basic, uh, Kihon Gata, I'm going to have to do this with a short sword just because of the distance I have in the camera here, right? So we're going to pretend this is a long sword, right? So uh, I've learned this out and exposed. I've also learned this from this Bato position. So this guy comes in, let's say he comes in with a, a Tento or a Shomen Giri kind of thing, this straight down cut uh, to the top of the face, top of the head, that kind of thing, right? So I'm going to shift off and my draw and and cut puts the boshi on this point on the wrist okay this is a primary target just like the small bones of the ankle just above the instep uh in the lower leg for stabbing uh they these were primary swordsman targets because when you go through the ankle it pops those really hard but thinly uh encased uh bones right it cracks them they pop like popcorn and they lose structure. So then as he's falling, you just do the finishing cut and go about your business. Okay. With this one, it's the same thing. Remember, he's coming in with a sword and he's holding it. So when I make contact with this and I cut it, it loses all structural integrity for that weapon. So if you look at kata, right, and a lot of people don't understand it because they're training with boken, right? There's a cut to a certain point and then... Uh, there's one in the Gyoko to you where you cut this and then you slide it across the other arm, right? Which, so the first one makes him not be able to control the sword with the one you just touched. I cut across the other arm in a way that it disengages that one. So now the sword's hanging down here. And then the finish comes across the throat or whatever that finishing move is, okay? So one of the key hone is to come down and catch this. Come on, better be really, really good. Because from here... The next target is right in front of the sword. People are, they're all over the place. You don't have time to bring this thing back to him. Okay. So I cut and then I just shove it straight forward. And so it goes from cutting a hand to stabbing through the opposite shoulder. Okay. So I took out one hand by engaging the wrist, go through the shoulder that disengages that one because when the katana goes through, gets a widening thing and it cuts, okay? Disengages that. And then as I run past this person and withdraw the sword out of that wound, I'm running past him, right? And it drags across his neck or the side, front, whatever. So it's one, two, three. There's no wind up. The, the retraction is a cut. The the next step from the counter to the, to the incoming cut whatever. Okay. So, um, interesting stuff. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, right. So again, just one of the primary things here is this three cuts to one engagement. So every time I engage him, he gets hit, uh, in combat handgun stuff. When I was a bodyguard and a federal cop and whatnot, right. You qualify with your weapon to make sure you can hit things, but the next level up for people that had to get in there and do things, okay? We did something called double tapping. And that is every time I engage the target, every time I engage, when I say target, it's a nice way of saying the bad guy is trying to kill me or somebody else. Every time I engage him, the trigger gets pulled twice. Two rounds go down range. So I have to be able to neutralize recoil, okay? And I have to understand the working mechanisms of this weapon so I don't pull the trigger all the way back here undo the trigger and then pull it again 
I have to understand that there's a reason that some automatic weapons work the way they do. And it's not because I'm firing off multiple rounds, semi-automatic, bang, 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 not that's fully automatic. Okay. Love when people argue about shit they don't know anything about. Anyway, but if you have one of these things, do it as a dry fire, right? Make that means don't have any rounds in it. Okay. But pull the trigger, get the hammer to drop, and then very slowly release the trigger very slowly. Because what you're listening and feeling for is a click. Now, you know, in a fight, you're not going to feel that, but you need to train your muscle memory so it knows where that is again and again and again so you don't have to think about it so i pull the trigger bang and then i release my finger to find that click point that click point is where the mechanism inside has reset and you can pull the trigger again most people fully release the trigger okay so there's grip and posture and neutralizing the three types of recoil all this kind of stuff but to to properly do a double tap I can't bang, bang, it's too slow, right? What I want is ba bang, ba bang, right? So the muzzle will rise a little bit because what we're aiming for at normal combat distance or average combat distance, which is 21 feet or seven imperial yards, right? Is a four inch shot group on the kill on the kill zone, which is, an, which is a four inch by 11 inch strip that gets overlaid on the silhouette target, okay? Why that one? Because when a round goes into that box, that rectangle, the body stops, right? Everything's disconnected. Hey, anything outside of it, I'm wounding him, those kind of things. But if he still has control of this, he could be falling. He could be on the ground. He could still engage. Okay. So anyway, it's the difference between combat and going to the range and putting holes in targets. Okay. So feeling got the, and then this last one that I have in dynamics, right, is te hodoki. Te hodoki. For anybody that, that knows the Japanese uh, words for a lot of our techniques, they're going to be confused here because te hodoki means hand escaping or hand releases or that kind of thing, right? Hodoki is escaping. Te, hand, right? These are your wrist grab defenses. What the hell? Okay. So he might grab my wrist. He might, okay? But if the sword's in my belt, it's quite possible that when I go to draw or to keep me from drawing him or, like if he's getting the jump on me, or his ally, he goes to draw, his ally comes in here and grabs my wrist or more likely grabs the tsuka, Okay. So when you learn wrist grab escapes, you are also learning how to get move the, the tsuka to get his hand off the weapon. It's a hand release. It's a hand break. So it's not necessarily escaping with your hand. It's freeing up the part of the weapon that he's grabbing and that kind of thing and using this leverage so I can break that grip and then draw and finish it. Okay, Because a lot of the things that came out of the old days – Right? If this guy drew his weapon from a distance, that was going to make me draw my weapon. So he knew that escalated everything to the fullest event or fullest uh, height. If we were of equal skill or he was of lesser skill, it was in his best interest to get a jump on me, to do a surprise attack. So I need to be able to free that up and go. This is also important for um, for multiple attackers and things like that. Right. So this is. Freeing the weapon. When the weapon itself is being attacked, and it doesn't matter if he attacks the hand that's holding on to it, grabs your wrist, whatever, or grabs the weapon, I need to get, I need to maintain control of that weapon. Okay. So Tehodoki. And then staging, right? This is this is actual combat. Okay. This is strategic control of a situation. He's trying to kill me. I'm, you know, trying to not die. And if I have to kill him, then I kill him as well. Okay. So believe it or not, another word here for staging is kata. And I don't mean kion kata, because these are one, anybody that's ever been in other types of martial arts, this is one step spark. That's what kion kata are. He does something, you do a move or three, and, but they're, they're primary single action things. 
These are the things that are like super, super important because they're going to show up over and over again. These are situational control models. Okay. So when we look at our kata, right, what we're looking at are here's a, a given attack and here's a way to resolve that in a way that puts him, not just kills him, but puts him in a certain place, finishes him a certain way from a certain angle, that kind of thing, right? So this is all strategic thinking, okay? Unarmed wise, I may need this guy face down on his chest so I can get him into cuffs, right? Anything I do that drops him on his back or his side, I now have more of a fight, more of a freaking struggle to get him onto his stomach so I can get him into handcuffs or get him into a restraint. But if what I do to get him to the ground naturally drops them there, it's much easier to get it, get that restraint, that ogyaku, that whatever, right? To, to get him into cuffs or flex it, whatever, okay? So this is strategic thinking, right? And here's, here's the irony. Everybody wants to do this for 90% of their training, at least, okay? Because it's entertaining. It feels like fighting. It feels like I'm actually a samurai. I'm actually a warrior in 16th century Japan. And I'm, I'm Miyamura Musashi, or I'm, uh, you know, Togakure uh, Nishina, uh, or uh, I'm sorry, Daisuke uh, Nishina, Togakure, whatever, right? Okay. But what we're looking at here is how am I handling certain types of attacks in a way that resolves them from somebody who's as good or better than me? Okay. So what we have here is we have techniques, we have kata, right? Versus blade. So it's blade on blade, because I have a sword, right? Versus what do we have? A uh, spear. Okay. You could call it staff if you want. Okay. But a staff is a um or spear, I'm sorry, a spear is a pole arm with a blade on the end of it. Okay, so just more reach. Okay, and besides that, who the hell would carry a long staff out into a battlefield where there's 36 inch razor blades and spear and halberd and stuff like that? Right, you know, you ended up with a staff on the battlefield. Okay, either you picked one up because that's what was laying around to save yourself for this moment, right? Or you had a spear and you did something and he lopped the freaking blade off of that, and you better do something now. Okay, but nobody would willingly grab a freaking long staff. Okay. Besides that, the way they thought about things back in the day, long staffs were walking sticks. They were the pole you took to the to the well to carry water back. Uh, just, you know, um, everybody wants to glorify things today that, okay, it's not that they weren't used. But if we think about a battlefield, why the hell would you have done that? When would you have used that? Same thing with a hanbo or a joe. Where did the where did the spear get cut? What do you have left in your hand that in this microsecond you need to do something now? But you're not going to go through the rest of the damn battle with that short stick when everybody has things that are longer. Okay? You're going to get something else. Where am I going to get that? Well, there's a bunch of dead fuckers around you with swords and whatever. Grab one. Keep going. Okay? That's why soldiers don't need to carry a shit ton of ammo. Because as soon as an engagement happens, guess what's laying all over the place? Okay. And if yours isn't laying there, there's a dead guy that has the other other side's weapon system with ammo for that one. Okay. It's the ability to prioritize. Okay. But if you haven't been there, or you haven't been mentored by people that were there, these are things that you typically don't think about. So going back to what I said at the beginning of this, this session, the people that don't think they need teachers because they can learn it by themselves, you can only learn what you're aware of as far as needs go. If you never thought about something, guess what you're not going to learn about? Guess what skills you're not going to have to be able to handle? Okay. So anyway, versus blade, versus spear, and versus combination weapons. Okay. What I mean by this is, now you could put staff here and then spear would be over there because it's kind of a combination weapon. But... Uh, there are kata. There's one that I can think of just off the top of my head from the Gyoko school where, um, and this is actually a mutodori technique, right? So you're unarmed and he has a blade. So he uh, comes at you with a katana and you get out of the way and you disarm him and immediately he grabs his short sword and, and takes you out or, well, tries because the kata shows you how to deal with that because the first move that you move into place 
dealing with the katana to disarm it should put you into a strategically advantageous position so he can't just easily cut you with the short sword. He has to work harder to get at you. But if we're only memorizing the moves so that we feel like we've got it, then we're missing we're missing the dynamics. We're missing the stuff that makes us the master that we want to be. Okay. And I'm not a master by any means. Okay. Um, but I think I have a pretty, pretty uh, good handle on what it is that I need to be training with and on and what my students need and how to translate this model to handgun, how to translate this model to rifle or shotgun, how to translate this model to spear. How to translate this model to unarmed. How to tra you get the idea, right? Okay. So anyway, hopefully this helped. Uh, if you want to download this nice little worksheet that I made, if you don't, you can type up your own, right? But if you want to download this so you can take notes, keep things in order and whatnot, um, then go to online ninjaacademy.com. Can you see that? Okay. Online ninjaacademy.com forward slash sword underscore skill hyphen prof short for proficiency right underscore worksheet dash lp okay lp right it's a landing page right and then the last forward slash is is uh not uber necessary okay uh i this link will be in the description uh we'll end up putting it in the description and it'll be in the comments uh beneath the video on youtube and the facebook pages and things like that you just need to give us a couple of days for it if you want to see more of this live doing things and some drills that I'm going to give students and things like that, this is our focus for this Friday's virtual training, right? Via Zoom. So for $4.99 US, you hop in for 75 to 90 minutes, work through some of this stuff. Again, we can only scratch the surface in, in that amount of time, but to jump into some of these things so that you get to see it in action and you get to see what uh, what you have to do, right? Uh, we actually re-released, we're re-releasing and, and redoing the videos uh, for my long distance guys and my local guys. We're, we're putting all the curriculum on video. It's already there, but technology wise and all that, we shot it like 20 freaking years ago, uh, whatever, right? So, uh, and it's in it's in seminar format and all that. So we're, we're changing the format, updating the technology, all that kind of stuff. So. The, the short of this is it put me a little bit behind. So if you're on live within the hour, the page there will be updated. You'll be able to click on it, reserve your spot for uh, the Friday class. Uh, I already have people that pre do it. They just, they just click on old links or whatever, reserve their spot. So out of the 15 spots I make available, because I can't cover a regular class and deal with a shit ton of people on zoom, so I limit it to 15 people, right? So right now, I think we have 11 or 12 spots left. And I didn't even open up the page for this week yet, okay? So anyway, that's there. So if you want to do this in real time, you can do it. If not, no harm, no foul. I just gave you all the stuff that you need to be working on, right? I don't need to cover like blade, staff, or spear, right? I mean, the point of these things is how do I do unto him before he can do unto me? with a blade, with a staff, pole, spear, weapon, whatever, and or with combo things, okay? So, um, but if you look at all the kata, that's that's all the stuff that they're pointing at, okay? And it's situational control and tactical. It's all this tactical stuff and everything combined, efficiency, effectiveness, that kind of thing, right? So, again, if you want the worksheet, online ninjaacademy.com forward slash sword underscore skill hyphen prof for proficiency underscore worksheet hyphen LP. That's a lowercase L. LP for landing page. It's just my way of coding. So I know what the hell I'm looking at. Okay. And uh, it'll put you on a list. The uh, the email system will send you an, an email with that, that link to it. Again, you can go get it sent to you and everything will be good. OK, if for whatever reason you click through to one of these things and it doesn't right, just send us an email at warrior C at warrior hyphen concepts, uh, warrior. The letter C at warrior. Concepts. 
online.com. Okay. And either I or James or one of the other uh, staff members or whatever will get it taken care of for you, get it sent out to you. No harm, no foul. Okay. That's it. It's another week's uh, Whiteboard Wednesday under our proverbial belt. And um, that's it. I'll see you next time. Or hopefully, I'll see you on Friday. Talk to you soon. Be safe. Train hard.